Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, we're going to be spending our time uh, in Matthew chapter 23 today. So uh, if you've got a Bible with you, uh, make sure that you've got that open. Uh, and as we begin, let's pray. Uh, dear God, we thank you for your word that we may hear you speak to us. Uh, help me to speak your words today that we may know you better as a result. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, an atheist was spending a quiet day fishing when suddenly the Loch Ness monster attacked his boat. Uh, in just a simple flip, the beast tossed him up in the air. He was flipping in the air. And as he turned around and the gravity started taking him and pulling him down, he saw that the maw of the beast was open and he was falling straight into his gullet. Uh, not knowing what else to do, he cried out, God, please help me. Suddenly everything froze in place. He hung midair, kind of not being able to move, but looking around when a voice bellows from the clouds. I thought you didn't believe in me. Come on, God, give me a break, he says. Just seconds ago, I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster either. Well, now that you're a believer, you must understand I can't just work miracles to snatch you out of certain death like this. I can change hearts, though. What would you have me do? Well, the atheist thinks for a little while and says, God, I know. Help the Loch Ness Monster to believe in you also. And God says, well, a little unorthodox, but sure, whatever. So the scene starts in motion again. And this time the beast snaps his jaws shut, grabs a flipper and grabs the guy out of the air. And as he's breathing a sigh of relief, the monster says, Lord, bless this food you've so graciously provided. Well, it's a bit of a silly joke. I'm sure many of you have heard it before. But the joke works in part because we don't expect the guy to actually call on God in the first place. Changes of heart are surprisingly rare. How many people today can't bring themselves to say they were wrong, even when they knew that they were? And how many times do I try to avoid responsibility by fudging the truth or omitting certain information? Um, Stuart, if you're listening, the answer is never. I never do that. Um, a throwaway line from a song in the, in the Disney movie Frozen uh, really stuck with me, that people don't really change. I, I don't think many people would challenge that idea. It seems kind of fair. Once a nasty person, always a nasty person, right? But the reason that those zero to hero adventure stories are so captivating is just that because they're too fantastic to be real. That someone so insignificant could become the great champion that the world needs. But God begs to differ. People can change. They just need some serious help. So let's have a look at the Bible and see where Jesus takes us in this story. But before we get to the parables, a little bit of context. At the end of chapter 12, just before uh, we open the page of uh, chapter 13, uh, Jesus' Mary mother, uh, sorry, Jesus' mother Mary and his brothers seem to be worried that maybe all this God stuff has gone to his head. And so they set out to try and get him before he take, makes too much of a, ha a problem for himself. It's time to come home. But when he's told that his mother and brothers are waiting outside to take him home, Jesus says to the crowd, who are my mother and my brothers? And then he points to his disciples and says, whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus isn't actually disowning his family. He's not trying to find an excuse to go on, you know, like, mom, I'm 33. I can get home when I need to. I can choose my friends. No, no. Jesus is explaining a reality about the relationship between God and humanity. That Jesus' real family isn't simply people that share his blood. It's not just people that grew up with him or people that look like him or people from the same region. No, God's family are those who listen to God with the goal of doing what he says. And this is a fundamental theme in Matthew's gospel. God is, God's family isn't a membership thing. It's a life thing. If you live for God, you're his child. You're his heir. 
All the good things that God offers are yours. But if you reject God, if you live for yourself, then it doesn't matter who you are or what you've done or how good you've been. If you're not part of his family, then you're not going to get the benefits of being part of his family. See, it seems that Jesus wants to explain this a bit more because when he's you know, taking a moment for himself and everyone follows him and he ends up finding himself in a boat looking out of a crowd of people that just need to know, need to understand who God is. He teaches again, and this time, all his teaching is are in parables, in stories that he's telling to help people get the point. And it makes kind of sense because all of Jesus' parables are about the relationship between God and humanity. See, Jesus isn't trying to get the people to be better or to love more, even though these themes are sometimes present. Uh, these stories were always about the way God relates to humanity and vice versa. Uh, and the parable we're looking at today is particularly helpful for two reasons. Uh, first, the message is pretty clear, even without the explanation that Jesus gives, although clearly that quite helps a lot. Uh, but secondly, Jesus uses this parable to explain why he uses parables at all. And both of these points will help us to understand what Jesus is trying to do and then how we can respond to it. See, the story itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, Jesus paints the picture of a farmer sowing seed. Uh, we can assume that the farmer's prepared the soil, turned it, watered it, so that all that's left is for the seed to fall in the furrows and take root. Uh, but in what can only seem kind of careless, only some of the seed falls where it should, while most of the seed falls on all the other parts of the farm. Some falls on the hardened path, and of course, because it's so hard, the seed can't take root. Uh, and so the seed finds a different job and it becomes bird seed for the local birds. Uh, other seed falls on the rocky soil. Uh, perhaps that's the, the, the soil and the rocks and all of the, the, the stuff that was pushed to the side uh, when the farmer was tilling the good soil. But there's not enough dirt in this pile. So while the seed's growth begins well, the roots don't take the way they should. The plant can't generate the sustenance it needs and it dies. Now, still more seed falls on the soil is tainted by weeds. It could be some ground that the farmers missed, uh, perhaps the overgrown scrub along the boundary of the field. And like the seed in the rocky soil, the plant, the, the plant initially grows, but the weeds choke it out and it dies. And finally, some seed falls on good soil and the results are amazing. With the numbers uh, that, that the farmer receives, he can lose even half of his seed to dodgy soil and he can still have a great year. And as we'll see a bit later on, I don't think we're seeing a careless farmer. Uh, in fact, uh, the metaphorical farmer intends the seed to be scattered across the four soils, even though the goal of humanity, the goal is a humanity that responds as one like the final soil. But before we get there, the disciples first ask Jesus why he speaks in parables. And as Jesus answers, we learn that while God calls us to change, he never actually forces change upon us. See, last year, uh, the Nichols family got a puppy called Cody. Uh, now, our puppy has got grown quite considerably. And eventually, the little doggy door that we got which fit him really well as a puppy. He was having to do contortions just to get through. He seemed quite fine with it. It's always been his door. It's, he just squeezes a bit more. But we thought, look, let's do him a favour. And we recently bought him a bigger one that actually fits his size. Problem was, he was instantly terrified of hurting himself because he wasn't used to that door. And after a week of the dog whining at the door, wanting to be let in, and I was sort of trying to stand back and be cool and no, not until you go through the door. But yeah, I just wanted to grab him by the collar and drag him through the door. And to be perfectly honest, a couple of times I, I kind of did. Uh, but in doing so, I probably set back the training quite considerably because we know that as soon as you try and force someone to do something, especially something they don't want to do, there's likely to be some resistance because 
It's not their idea anymore. Now it's your idea and they have to do it. So I think this is what the parables are all about. God is helping us to choose well, but he doesn't want to enslave us. So rather than speaking plainly, such that those who don't even want to follow God are strangely compelled to anyway, Instead, he speaks in such a way that it's only those who are actually listening and thinking who will understand the message. It seems kind of harsh, but you need to remember two things about this. First, remember that it is his generous and undeserved grace that even one of us can hear and understand his words. And second, it was the hard hearts of the religious leaders of the day that took Jesus to the cross. Without those hard hearts, without the cross, all of this is for nothing. It's not that God was forcing some to stay hardened so that others may go free. But rather, as he reveals his love to all, he allows each one to respond according to their own heart. Not to do what they would never do, but to almost solidify them in choosing their own path. I think it's important to understand this because it puts the farmer's motives from the parable in a whole new light and therefore God's motives, which I think is really important. But let's get back to the story as Jesus clarifies to the disciples what it means. At first, Jesus explains that God is the farmer, the seed is his word, and the soils represent the different responses that the various people have to his word. Now, notice the seed is the same every time. He doesn't just sprinkle a little bit of cheap seed on the path, given it's going to just be bird seed in the end. And he gets like the best seed and, the, and most of it going on the good soils. The seed goes everywhere. As I said before, it seems careless, but there's a reason for it. So these soils are grouped into the four, four different ways that people may respond to God. And I don't think... People only ever belong in one. In fact, I'm sure I've responded all four ways in a single day. Again, I don't think we're supposed to spend too much time analysing what soil that we are. Instead, we're supposed to understand why the farmer's planting the seed in the first place. So that his word would grow in us. Of course, the best case is that we're the good soil, that the word grows and grows and grows rather than the word kind of withering and dying inside us. But the bigger question is why? Why is God wasting so much seed on the path and the rocks and the weeds? As much as it may seem, God is not being careless. He is sending seed everywhere because he cares for the whole farm. He cares for the rocky soil and the soil with the weeds and the hardened path. He loves every bit. And he dearly wants every bit of soil to have that opportunity to hear his word, to be moved, to change, that his word may grow. See, God is sharing his message to the world that Jesus is his chosen king and that all those who follow him will finally finally be able to be the the people that God originally intended them to be. But so many still refuse to hear the message altogether. And from those who do hear the message, many refuse to be changed, while others may be willing, but maybe they don't care about it enough to let the change truly happen. In short, the gospel does two things. It changes the hearts of those who desire to hear And it confirms those hearts that were hardened against God. Again, it's not that Jesus is forcing people to reject him. It's actually the opposite. He's specifically not forcing them to accept him. Even though he knows that that is what is best. You might wonder why the disciples get to find all this out while so many others didn't. Notice that when Jesus is speaking, it's the disciples that come and talk to him later and he kind of reveals it to them. And it's true, they had an amazing privilege that they not only got to hear Jesus' words, but they had the first chance to understand it. But remember that God, uh, Jesus is 
speaking in parables so people don't just automatically get it and are almost forced to do what they otherwise wouldn't do. And also, don't get envious because their privilege is small compared to ours. They had far less knowledge of who Jesus is than pretty much anyone here on Zoom today. So if they were in a privileged position, our privilege is so much more. Even if this is your first time with us today, even if you've never really thought about any of this before, arguably you're still in a better position than the people gathered around Jesus' feet. Because after three years, they still didn't get it. While the youngest members of Kids Church here, they do. I mean, it's not that surprising. We have the whole story. And we can know what it means with very little work. But that's what it's like to be the good soil. You're not any better than any other soil. You don't have any right to be proud. And you don't get more seed or better seed. You don't have a better relationship with the farmer or anything. You are just as loved by the farmer. And you get to know him as much as anyone else is able to. The difference is that you stop and listen. You receive the seed, let it grow inside you, that you are changed. So you get to live as his child, living the way he intended. Now, don't get me wrong, we won't always get it right. You might stuff up a hundred times a day. But the more that we listen and respond, the more we are changed to be more like him. See, that's it really. That's what this parable is all about. It's not about trying to be the best soil you can be. Soil is soil. People are people. It's not about how good you are at listening or how brilliant you are at responding to him. They're great. They're great things to do. Please keep listening. Please work on how we keep responding to God even when it's hard. And it's so good to be able to grow and be better. But at the heart of this parable, the call is to listen, to respond, and to live accordingly. See, it's the farmer that works the soil. He's the one that clears away the rocks and the weeds. It's the farmer that actually prepares that good soil. And it's the seed that grows. All the soil does is accept the seed and give it a good and fertile place to grow. That's what Jesus is calling us to be. That's what Jesus wants his people to be, a fertile place for his word to grow. A place where his message of love and hope for all humanity can flourish. See, no matter what your relationship with God is, this story speaks to each one of us. If you don't know Jesus as your king, then Jesus is suggesting you simply listen. You may not have heard this before. Just stop. Listen. Hear what God has to say to you. Well, you may have heard it, but it didn't really mean anything to you. Or or that there were better things going on. You got distracted. Maybe you even feel a bit guilty that all those years ago, when you could have, you kind of set it aside. But if this is the God of the universe, then it might be good to stop and find out why, why he's still talking to you. Why he hasn't stopped sprinkling that seed on you time after time. So keep listening to Jesus. We're going to be thinking about Jesus' words in Matthew throughout January here online at Christchurch Northern Beaches. So please keep logging in. Please keep listening. And if you have a Bible at home, why don't you read the book of Matthew for yourself? And if you don't have a Bible at home or uh, you're not sure where to start, then let us know. We'll get one, to, uh, get one out to you. Uh, we'd be even happy to, to pray with you or read the Bible with you if you'd like. And if Jesus is your king, then Jesus is also calling you to listen. It doesn't matter how often you've been the good soil or how many rocks or weeds are kind of getting choked up. Keep listening. Let the word take root. Let God work you into the good soil that he's made you to be. And having listened, 
respond. Remember that you are a place where God's word can grow. So don't hide it. Don't stifle it. Let it grow. Let it change you. Let it pull your focus away from your, yourself. That you might lift your eyes onto God and the people around you. Let it affect the decisions you make. The words you choose. That you stand out for your kindness and your love. Live like God's word has taken root deep inside you. Live the way that God is the one that guides you because that is precisely what he promises to do for all who choose him. Live as the soil he's made you to be that you might be people that not only hear his word but let his word take root inside you that you may grow and be more like him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who plants his word in us if we would but listen and respond. So please help us to do just that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.